have become a people of precision. <laughs> Welcome to worship on this, the first day of November, all joining us in person or online. We're glad that you're here. Uh, if you're watching this live or you're here this morning, thanks for turning your clock back an hour. We're glad that you came, although if you hadn't have, you'd have been here early, you could have helped with setup or, or just spent some extra time in prayer, who knows. Uh, anyway, we invite you all to keep in touch, including you. Uh, using the connection card at stpaulsnobleton.ca slash connect. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell because it all makes a difference and it lets you know too when we are going to be online again. And we welcome comments, we welcome prayer requests, and we're going to worship the Lord together as Christine reads from Isaiah chapter 59. Good morning. The scripture reading is taken from Isaiah 59, verses 15b to 21. The Lord looked and was displeased to find there was no justice. He was amazed to see that no one intervened to help the oppressed. So he himself stepped in to save them with his strong arm, and his justice sustained him. He put on righteousness as his body armor and placed the helmet of salvation on his head. He clothed himself with a robe of vengeance and wrapped himself with a cloak of divine passion. He will repay his enemies for their evil deeds. His fury will fall on his foes. He will pay them back even to the ends of the earth. In the west, people will respect the name of the Lord. In the east, they will glorify him. 
For he will come like a raging flood tide driven by the breath of the Lord. The Redeemer will come to Jerusalem to buy back those in Israel who have ruined, who have turned from their sins, says the Lord. And this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit will not leave them, and neither will these words I have given you. They will be on your lips and on the lips of your children and your children's children forever. I, the Lord, have spoken. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Creator, Christ in spirit, God of life and blessing, you created all that exists. In Christ, you offer your redeeming love to every soul in every situation. So it is our greatest joy to be united by your spirit in the community of your people, stretching throughout the generations all around the world you love. God of all people, all places, all situations, we come seeking your strength, your peace, and your direction. We pray for loved ones who are sick, Tend to them, O Lord. Lay your healing hand on them and soothe their pain. You are the mighty healer and redeemer, and we ask you to bless them and keep them safe. We pray for our loved ones who live away from us, at a senior's residence, in a different community or country. Help them to know that we are thinking about them and we love them, even though we may not be able to visit at this time. Bless those of us who are worshiping in our homes and those who are here and at other churches. Forgiving God, we confess that we try to fit you into our plans and not plan around serving you. Forgive us for filling our lives with so many voices and distractions that we fail to make room for you. We ask that your Holy Spirit speak to us today to draw us closer to you. We pray for those who face violence, persecution, and chaos in their homes, workplaces, and communities. Bring peace into their lives. On this All Saints Sunday, we remember our loved ones who have gone ahead of us, who taught us and loved us. We continue to pray for our church leaders here at Nobleton, those in our presbytery, those in Canada and around the world as they continue to navigate this new worship space. God of many generations, your word comes to us as the witness of your saints over the years. Open our hearts as the scriptures are read and proclaimed this day so that we too may hear your wisdom and come to know Christ more deeply as your living word. Amen. When we change the clocks, we do so here twice a year, once for you and once for me. This is the time you do it for me. Otherwise, I would have to give the benediction and we'd go home based on what time my watch currently says. Yes, belt and suspenders, but some habits are hard to break. <clears throat> Years ago, I had a congregant who was known for a particular saying. She would say, if you can't say something nice, say something about the weather. We all want to be nice. We think it's virtuous to be nice. And I'm not actually sure that this idea is found in the Bible. At least not with the word nice attached to it. But we try to be nice because we want to be liked by everybody. And yet, isn't that kind of a silly notion to start with? We want to be liked by everybody, but that's not... Po we, not even we like everybody, so why could we be liked by everybody? 
And because human beings have a bad habit of supposing that God must be like us and must think the way we think, being nice has often led to the notion that God must be nice. But God is not nice. God is holy. God is righteous. God is just. God is not, in our sense of the term, nice. Oh, God is good, but He is not nice. Nice is a term that we have come up with perhaps as a means of avoiding talking about the weather. It's because we tend to think of God as nice that the concluding section of Romans chapter 11 might seem awkward to us when read in context. And I say when read in context because if you just lift it out of its context, you might become somebody who would think that God is especially nice. But context is everything, and we have been spending the past several months looking at context for this passage. So with that in mind, we're going to turn to Romans 11:25 to 36 and discover a few surprising things, and uh, perhaps we'll make a few more stops along the way than usual, just so you know. Paul says, I want you to understand this mystery. That is a, a hidden truth from the mind of God. I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters, so that you will not feel proud about yourselves. Again, as last week we learned that for some reason some of these Gentile Christians were uh, feeling superior to the Jewish believers uh, and the Jewish people generally. God chose the Jews so that the Gentiles would likewise be blessed according to His covenant with Abraham in Genesis 12. But that was no reason to be haughty because as we learned last week, the Gentiles were unnaturally grafted into this mighty olive tree that is His chosen people, Israel. Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts. Some, which means there must be a remnant of faithful Jews. But this will last only until the full number of Gentiles comes to Christ. Now, what is this full number? It's the number of Gentiles that God has determined must come to know the Lord who will come into the kingdom of God. Then what will happen? And so, that is, in this manner, all Israel will be saved. Now, doesn't that sound nice? All Israel will be saved. It all works out in the end. Isn't God nice? Well, it may seem so on the surface, but we need to ask ourselves what all Israel means. Is it the church? Is it spiritual Israel, the Jews who have come to believe? Or is it some Israelites as a representative whole? I want to suggest the latter, given that the Bible often refers to all Israel when only some people are being referenced. For example, in 2 Samuel 16.22, Absalom is in conflict with his father, King David, and he sets up a tent where he can have his way with David's concubines, um, and he says that he will do so, uh, where the, the NLT says, where everyone could see, but in the original it says, where all Israel could see. Now, not all of Israel is going to see into this tent for whatever merrymaking would have been going on, just a representative group. So, all Israel will be saved refers to a representative group of Israel, which we take to mean a group of Jews who are in existence at the time of the second coming, thus giving Israel a remnant plus, those who will see the second coming. And how will this representative group be saved? Well, that's where context is so helpful. We go back to Romans 10.13 and are reminded that those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is, these Israelites will see Jesus and they will believe the Gospel. Now, why do we believe this has to do with the second coming? Well, we'll read on. Paul quotes some Old Testament here. He says, as the Scriptures say, the one who rescues will come from Jerusalem and he will turn Israel away from ungodliness. And this is my covenant with them, that I will take away their sins. 
Now that's Paul quoting part of Isaiah 59, which Christine read earlier, and a snippet from Isaiah 27. But you may have noticed something where Paul says there's one who rescues who will come from Jerusalem. The version in the Old Testament actually says one who will come to Jerusalem. So Paul is adapting this citation from the Old Testament, as he is wont to do, to refer to who he knows to be the one who rescues. The one who rescues is the Lord Jesus Christ at His second coming. And if you read 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, we know that Paul believes that Jesus will return from heaven, that is, the heavenly Jerusalem. So when he says that the one who rescues Jesus will come from Jerusalem, he is saying that this representative group called all Israel will be saved by the one who comes from the heavenly Jerusalem at the end of time as we know it. So at Jesus' second coming, He will come from heaven to turn Israel away from ungodliness because of God's faithfulness to His covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hold that thought. We'll carry on. Many of the people of Israel are now enemies of the good news. That is because they refuse to believe the gospel. And this benefits you Gentiles. Yet they are still the people he loves because he chose their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Again, God pledged faithfulness to the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. Once you Gentiles were rebels against God, but when the people of Israel rebelled against him, God was merciful to you instead. Now they are rebels And God's mercy has come to you so that they too will share in God's mercy. For God has imprisoned everyone in disobedience, that is, in the consequences of sin, so He could have mercy on everyone. Now, Paul concludes Romans 9, 10, and 11, wherein he has focused on the salvation of the Jews, and there's a lot of theology in those chapters, and I'm as glad to be graduating from them as you are. But... With theology comes doxology. And so Paul concludes Romans 11 with a word of praise, a doxology. Oh, how great are God's riches, that is, His infinite kindness on all sorts of people, and wisdom and knowledge, foreknowledge, that is, God's election, how impossible it is for us to understand His decisions and His ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? That's from Isaiah 40. And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? That's from Job 41. Who can know the Lord's thoughts? This is praise, right? Who has given him so much? In the words of the great theologian Mel Lastman, Nobody! That's the implication, right? Rhetorical question. For everything comes from Him and exists by His power and is intended for His glory. All glory to Him forever. Amen. Again, because context is important, we need to remember that there is a line of movement here in God's covenant of salvation. God makes covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Many Jews reject that covenant Gentiles are included in God's plan of salvation, and the Jews are once again included in God's plan of salvation. Again, think of that olive tree analogy from last week. Uh, the, The root of the tree is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Some Jews remain part of the tree. Uh, The Gentiles are grafted in. And then the time will come where more Jews will likewise be grafted into that mighty olive tree. So right now, God is saving some Jewish people, a remnant, as they come to faith in Christ today. And when Jesus returns, there will be more. A lot of Jews in Paul's day look to politics and military might to erase Gentile oppression and establish God's kingdom. But it's clear that Paul here understands that the establishment of God's kingdom will take place when Jesus returns. That can all seem a bit confusing. 
So I want to boil it down to a few points that will make more sense for us as 21st century followers of Jesus. I hope this helps. First, the passage teaches us that when God has decided that a sufficient number of Gentiles have come to faith in Christ, Jesus will return. Now, people will spill all kinds of ink and cut down all sorts of trees to write about how they know when Jesus is going to come back. But it's not for us to know. Somebody in every generation says, Oh, we know. We've got it figured out when Jesus is going to return. Nobody's been right yet. And even Jesus Himself says that no one knows except the Father when He will return. Only God knows. We can know the Bible backwards and forwards, and we still can't predict it. But on the opposite extreme of that is a group of people, and it includes some people in the church, who either don't think about Jesus' return at all, or they don't believe that He will return. And part of this is to be blamed on the fact that the church has not taught sufficiently on the second coming of Jesus in recent years. I mean, it's right there in our basic creedal statement, right? Right in the Apostles' Creed, it says, He will come again to judge the living and the dead. But do we think about that? Not really. It doesn't seem to affect our day-to-day living. But if we did think about it, do you suppose it might actually affect our day-to-day living? Maybe. Jesus is coming again. We don't know when. And we don't know how precisely, but He will come to inaugurate His kingdom. And at that time, there will be more Jewish people who will be added to the realm of the faithful and the final judgment will take place. But for that to happen, the number of Gentiles that God deems sufficient will have to come to faith, which means we still have work to do in the faith-sharing department. In these COVID times, I've heard more people than usual talking about Jesus' second coming and wishing it would happen soon. Do you pray that Jesus will return soon? If you do, good. Now understand that God will answer your prayer in part through the conversations that you have with friends and family that will lead them to confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. So if you want to experience the second coming sooner than later, go out there and lead your friends to Christ. So when God has decided that a sufficient number of Gentiles have come to faith in Christ, that's when Jesus will return. Second, know that at that time there will be elect Jews who will come to faith in Christ. The remnant of Jews who respond to the gospel will be expanded as they witness the second coming of Jesus and believe that He is the Son of God and the promised Messiah. But this shouldn't stop you, of course, from sharing your faith with your Jewish friends today. The remnant can grow, but those who are present at the second coming of Jesus will likewise realize their election and come to faith when they see Him face to face. But, and this is the third point, understand this, not everyone will be saved. There is more than one global pandemic out there right now. Did you know that? More than one global pandemic. Coronavirus gets all the press, but there is another one, and it is rampant even in the church. And that is the pandemic of universalism. The idea that everybody is going to be saved. It's actually, I call it, the doctrine of niceness. If God is nice, He's going to save everybody. It may be nice, but it doesn't hold any water biblically. I call it a pandemic because it exists everywhere and it seems easily spread because we all want to be liked and we all want to be nice. And frankly, it's why a lot of people don't talk about their faith. I mean, if everybody's going to heaven, why should I bother having that awkward conversation about Jesus? There is no part of the Bible read in context that gives even a hint of universal salvation. Again, I point to that watershed text in Romans 10 in verse 9 where it says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. There's an obvious condition on salvation there. Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart. But here we are, living each day pretty much assuming, perhaps implicitly, 
that everybody's going to heaven, so let's just leave the topic of faith alone. And that has a lot to do, a lot to do with why the Christian faith is waning in society today. The consistent witness of Scripture, and it's all we got to go on, is that not everyone will be saved, as nice as that would seem to be. I mean, think about it. If everyone were going to be saved, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? God so loved the world, yes, the whole world, that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Everyone. Everyone who believes in Him. Faith is required, else Jesus died in vain. What about people of other faiths? Well, as I said last week, we share our faith humbly as one beggar telling another where to find food. And anybody who has studied philosophy can tell you better than I can that not every promise in the world can come true. I said promise. I meant premise. Not every premise in the world can be true. So if we say that Christianity is true, that's an exclusive statement. Because if Christianity is true, then there are other things which stand in contradiction to that which therefore must not be true. And that's why a biblical Christian faith is not particularly politically correct. And it's not nice. But it is true, and it is life-changing. So share your faith humbly. The last time I checked, by the way, turn or burn was not an effective means of evangelism. Uh, but a relationship with another person is. So share your faith humbly with friends and family, even those who have other belief systems, because not everybody's going to be saved. But as far as it depends on you and me, it should not be for lack of having heard the gospel. So, Jesus is coming again when God says enough Gentiles have been saved. When Jesus comes again, more Jews will come to faith in Christ and not everyone will be saved as much as we wish it were true. All right, so what do you do with this? What are you going to do with it? What are some steps that you can take in your growing journey of faith as a result of this challenging passage? Consider these. You can pray for the second coming of Christ. Paul concludes his first letter to the Corinthians with a prayer which is translated, Our Lord, come. It's the word Maranatha, which, uh, I mean, other than being a music publishing corporation, doesn't get a lot of use nowadays, but it means, Our Lord, come, Maranatha. In fact, it's the name of a Christian Reformed church in Woodbridge, but it doesn't get a lot of press nowadays. It also doesn't appear elsewhere in the Scripture, but there's a variant of it that appears in the second last verse of the entire Bible. In Revelation 22:20, 20, it says, Come, Lord Jesus. It's been prayed by Christians since the time Jesus ascended into heaven, promising that He would come again. We don't know when it will take place. Every generation thinks it knows based on world events or numbers or life circumstances, but we cannot predict it. All we can do is be ready. That involves having a living, growing faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior for yourself. It involves sharing that faith with other people. It involves engaging with the church in small groups, whether in person or online these days, so you can build your faith and encourage one another. And it involves some aspect of serving God through serving others. We don't know what all will be involved in the second coming, second coming of Jesus, but we can pray for it, even yearn for it. So if you'll pray for the second coming, make note of that in the comments or on your online connection card at stpaulsnobleton.ca slash connect and just type in the word pray. Second, and this builds on the first, you can continue to witness to God's grace at work in your life by telling other people your story of faith and encouraging them to embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior. 
we're used by God to bring about whatever magic number of Gentiles it's going to take to trigger Jesus' return. We do know this. It is not 144,000. That is the number that is a very symbolic term used in one place in the book of the Revelation. And the misguided Jehovah's Witnesses claim that it will be the number of people in heaven. But I don't know about you, I'm pretty sure, I'm hoping, I'm praying that the number of people in heaven by the time I get there is going to be a whole lot more than that. Our job isn't to figure out the number. Our job is to report for duty. And Jesus has commissioned us to go and make disciples of all nations. How'd you make out in your efforts to share your faith as I challenged you a few weeks ago? If it didn't work then, or you didn't take up the challenge, let me encourage you to try this week to reach one person with the eternity-changing love of Jesus. If you'll do that, type the word witness in the comments or in your connection card. It can be as simple as sharing your story of faith, inviting another person to view our broadcasts, maybe have a conversation with them afterwards. Whatever the Lord leads you to do, witness to God's love in Jesus. And finally, because we know the Bible does not teach it to be true, a good response to this passage is to correct any thought that everyone will be saved. It may mean giving up being nice. It may mean breaking that rule that you never talk about politics or religion. Because this, this is actually one of the reasons the world's in the predicament it's in right now, right? We were always told polite conversation doesn't involve faith, it doesn't involve politics. And as a result of that, we have been rendered unable to have civil conversation about faith or politics. Because of the pandemic of belief in universal salvation, many people would rather not upset any apple carts by invoking a conversation that may prompt some sort of disagreement. Remember, it's your job to sow the seed. It's God's job to do the watering and the growing. When you've shared your faith, you've done all you can. Let God do the heavy lifting. We're not required to convince, right? We are required to witness because not everybody is going to be saved. If you've been thinking everybody's going to be saved and you're willing to let Scripture correct you on that matter, then type correct in the comments or in your online connection card. i got to admit, I realized by the time I got to the end of writing my notes for this that the title I gave this message was lame. That title was not going to bring anybody in the door this week. But now that I've finished it, I really think I should have called it Stop Being Nice Christians. So that's my charge to you today. Stop being nice Christians. God isn't nice anyway. He's holy, He's righteous, He's just, He is good. And faith in Jesus is so important that it has to trump being nice. Because Jesus is coming again. May it be soon. Let's pray. O Lord, come, Maranatha. In these days of trial and challenge, many followers of Jesus are crying out to you to bring your kingdom in its fullness now. But we remember that the fruit of the Spirit is patience, and we need patience for that as much as we do for so many other things. We pray for the people to whom we will witness to your love and grace and mercy. Open their hearts, Lord, and make them ready to receive our witness. We pray for the Jewish people that you will, by grace, engraft them once again. And we pray for those who do not concern themselves about a relationship with you because they believe everyone will be saved. Oh, how we wish that were true. But your word suggests otherwise. So help us to be winsome in our witness and to help others to know and love and serve you that Jesus will return and your kingdom will come. Empower us with your Holy Spirit to do all to which you call us for the glory of our Savior Jesus, 
our coming King. Amen. We'd like to keep in touch with you if you're here or if you're online. So please do make use of that connection card at stpaulsnobleton.ca slash connect and we'd love to pray for you and be of any uh, help we can possibly be. We're going to sing a gospel song that uh, many of you will remember from your past. It's uh, a call to action. It's called We've a Story to Tell to the Nations. And I'll invite you to rise if you're able. to honor God and all God's saints, praying that we too may be a blessing to those who come after us. We thank you for the support of God's mission at St. Paul's Nobleton, and there are a number of ways you can continue to give and support God's mission here. You can bring a gift and leave it at the front of the sanctuary, or you may mail in a check into 5750 King Road in Nobleton. You can also send a gift through PayPal at stpaulsnobleton.ca slash giving. Or you can make a donation via e-transfer to donate at stpaulsnobleton.ca. We appreciate your faithfulness. Please stand as we close. We're going to sing Mighty to Save.
look today knowing that the Lord is mighty to save and that by his grace there may be others who may be saved by your words, by your deeds, by your faith. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of us and those we love this day.